I felt really burdened by not being able to know what everyone else seemed to know. But in this moment, it was like, I understood that social exchange could be like singing to one another. And that's, that's everything. I was like born in that moment. This is our humble hemp patch. 5,000 years of medical cannabis use. We're learning about other cannabinoids. Marijuana is grown in every state in the union. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences. And this is The Lex Files. It was so enlightening for me to hear the story of Aaron Paul Orsini. I found him because he's active on Twitter building a community around neurodiversity and the use of psychedelics. His own experience with LSD caused him to write the excellent book, Autism on Acid, how LSD helped me understand, navigate, alter, and appreciate my autistic perceptions. It's a beautiful book and worth reading by anyone looking to understand the power of psychedelics. Aaron also runs the website autismonacid.com, which is a treasure trove of resources for people who want to learn more about insights and best practices. And if you want to get involved, look up the Autistic Psychedelic Community on Twitter. Aaron clearly wants to help other people the way the LSD has helped him. And there's a whole lot to learn in this interview. He's a great speaker, and it was a truly beautiful conversation. I felt a personal connection to him through the course of it. And it turns out, as we realized after the interview, that we had met before. But we're saving that surprise part of the story for next week's episode. For now, enjoy this wonderful talk from Aaron Paul Orsini. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be joined today by Aaron Paul Orsini. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Alex. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. So you're the force behind Autism on Acid, the site and the Twitter feed, and also a community around using LSD for people on the spectrum and neurodivergent. And so I just wanted to ask about, perhaps before we get into the juicy bits about LSD, in your book, which I think was really an excellent piece of work, you described what it was like to be on the spectrum before you had LSD. And I was wondering if you could explain that to us. Yeah, for sure. And uh, just to kind of reiterate that, like the title of the, the title of the text in terms of the full title is Autism on Acid, How LSD Helped Me Understand, Navigate, Alter, and Appreciate My Autistic Perceptions. Uh, and so digging into that, um, you know, that first aspect being the understanding aspect. Um, and in some sense, uh, and again, we'll touch on the LSD in a bit, um, but that understanding was really further developed later along as I, you know, when I stepped out of my uh, default sort of perception, I became aware of what that normal mode of perception was. And that gave me a place to reflect upon that. Uh, but nonetheless, I still had somewhat of an awareness of the difficulties um, that are fairly common in the biopic uh, tellings of other autistics in terms of uh, general difficulties with socializing or sort of uh, sort of s certain senses related to self-awareness. Um, I have learned a great deal more about a condition that's called alexithymia, um, which isn't necessarily... Um, caused quote unquote by autism it's often concurrent with autism um, and some also experience alexithymia through a myriad other um, sources like it uh, sort of trauma induced or otherwise but i think that more than anything was one of the most impactful uh, factors in my anxious depressed and otherwise dissociated or disoriented state as an autistic and in that sense, I had a difficulty with identifying what's known as interoceptive states, which are inner feeling states. How do I feel? How do I feel towards someone else's feeling? Or how does that other person feel? Um, and this isn't so much an intellectual absence. I could still move through in a rationally deductive way and discern what that individual um, was most likely experiencing in terms of, you know, decoding certain signaling or having gone through enough situations that there's a certain amount of uh, forensic socializing, as I put it in the book, that was somewhat adaptive. And I think a lot of autistics would echo the same in terms of uh, there's a term known as masking, wherein uh, we learn social scripts, we learn ways to 
uh, sort of repeat, if they say this, I'll say this. If they say that, I'll say this. Uh, and so those sort of adaptations were commonplace, but there's a certain point where that intellectual sort of rote memorization, uh, you know, something that's presently handled through um, reinforcement techniques um, in autistic youths, something that's also fairly controversial in terms of, you know, are we uh, conditioning away from natural behaviors in autistics? Uh, how can we honor um, you know, their natural mode of operation. And that's very dear to my heart. Um, as uh, psychedelics have helped me rediscover sort of who I was before I went through the grand uh, dance of trying to sort of m mimic uh, other behaviors that weren't necessarily natural in my predisposition. So mm -hmm. it's a really broad landscape as far as what were the difficulties. And that my attitudes towards those difficulties have also shifted dramatically over time in the sense that I didn't realize how much of my quote like difficulties or my disorderly nature was also rooted in a culturally held belief and expectation, uh, the certain uh, social circles I found myself in, you know, in the time since publishing, I've spent a lot more time in neurodiverse uh, circles wherein there's a certain level of accommodation that's natural. I think neurodiverse individuals are, are acclimated to being asked to behave in a way that fits other people's uh, perception of how they ought to behave. And I think when I'm in a neurodiverse space, there's a certain allowance for, oh, you need some extra time to work up that thought or, oh, you're going to have to have a pause there or, oh, I notice you're making a repetitive movement here. There's a certain amount of like acceptance and tolerance of that because we all know that we need it for ourselves. And I think that's really, I think, the 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 narrative that I'm really beginning to understand more in depth myself and something that I'm also trying to bring through my advocacy efforts, not only for psychedelics, but also for autism awareness. I'm, I don't represent every autistic individual. My experience is unique in my own regard. There's differences across gender, there's differences across culture. So as far as the, you know, innate difficulties I experienced, the core of it was that disassociative sort of absence of that in, intuition in my youth. And, and that led to a lot of the difficulties and depression and somewhat of a, a sort of suicidal ideation, even after I was uh, diagnosed with autism spectrum. And just to go back to the a definition of Alexis the um, the so it would be a, an inability to kind of identify and describe emotions. Yeah, and it's believed to be a more so a processing issue. A parallel that I draw often is uh, I've heard from certain persons who are dyslexic who will draw the comparison of uh, they see uh, lines on a on a book page uh, before they. Uh, upcycle those into conceptual, uh, you know, bundles of data to discern, like the kind of, they're seeing like the, the trees for the forest, so to speak. Um, and so in that same way, I am still working through these understandings, because there's not a great deal of, you know, deep, uh, empirical, um, research or evidence-based research or brain imaging research surrounding alexithymia. It's technically not like a, a clinical diagnosis. It's just, it's more so a condition uh, that tends to be comorbid. So specific to that, um, in the sense that it's a processing issue, it seems to be that based on all my experiences, that the signals are coming in and somewhere in between the inputs and my awareness of the inputs, there's an interruption or a disturbance or perhaps a trauma-induced blockage um, or a closing or a synaptic pruning. There's so many possible, possible explanations. But what I'm most concerned with is the way in which uh, psychedelics seem to make a bridge between the incoming signals and my ability to process them, whether that was because there was simply a connection formed between key regions of my brain or because uh, a certain level of like mental quieting enabled a, a certain amount of like bodily awareness. There's so many different ways I could explain the whys. And that's a lot of why I'm turning to scientists, PhDs, and other autistics for their take um, on if they've experienced anything like this. And I think the most immediate example, I was actually just listening to your interview um, with uh, Dr. Holland for her book, Good Chemistry. And she had a mentioning in her book about an alexithymic individual who was suspected to also be on the spectrum, who was also able to come into an awareness. I think there's an anecdotal story 
of that individual sort of forming a fist at one point and realizing they were angry uh, and not necessarily from like an intellectual place, but like from a, uh, I feel anger. It's like undeniably felt in the way that a fire placed on your hand is undeniably like fire, you know it. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot to explore as far as the possibilities of not only LSD as I've written about fairly extensively, but also psilocybin as I've experienced directly and as well as MDMA, which is uh, a large body of research and a lot more momentum in terms of uh, availability in, in the near term. So a lot to explore. And alexithymia is definitely something that, um, you know, I didn't know of and I didn't come into an awareness until well into my personal research. There's a, a Reddit community that I've leaned on a bit to learn a bit more about it. There's uh, there's a lot you can uh, look up about it. Um, but it's, it's something that I think I really want to highlight that because I think when I initially published the work, I thought that... Um, uh, most of my autism was defined by the alexithymic condition. And although there's a great deal of overlap, I think that one of the most immediate clarifying points I love to really include right off the bat, because I really don't want to off-put any caretakers or any autistics themselves, is that none of my work is uh, with the intention or belief that I have, quote, cured any aspect of being autistic. I think this is an identity that I'll always hold in the same way that I will uh, maintain like my country of origin, regardless of if I like change to another place. Uh, I think that I'm, st I remain autistic, but I remain better informed about mm, what it means to be born into the seat of autism and what it means to change seats uh, in the theater of awareness as well, and then return and how that experience really shapes uh, just so much of, of how to become aware of myself, others, and, and the grander uh, experience of, of life. I liked one of the ways you put it about having one tunnel of information and being very good at that, which could be a more uh, autism type trait versus having many tunnels. And now you get yeah. to use both. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Greek, uh, autism has the root meaning of self isolated. And so if we are to apply that to psychedelics, I think uh, I imagine a lot of your listenership is kind of uh, a psychedelic audience before maybe an autistic audience, perhaps. And I think those in the psychedelic communities are pretty well learned or experienced in psychedelics are quite aware of how psychedelics can uh, change that boundary from self and other or self and everything. And, and that sort of, um, you know, dissolving of those boundaries can be inherently therapeutic in, in any person. And I think especially in autistics who might be predisposed to being a bit more sort of trapped in uh, the notion of going sort of quote far out uh, for autistics in my experience. And again, we'll, maybe we can talk a bit about dosing in a bit. Uh, there's a certain like golden point that I seem to have like zoned in on that allowed me to go f like farther out than my far in place while still maintaining a sort of uh, a balance uh, and something that seems to contrast some of the experiences I've had with other non-autistic persons uh, who are taking similar dosages as me that are having much more hallucinogenic experiences than me, whereas I'm kind of just having the sense of being embodied uh, or uh, some, some others have referred to it as like feeling at home. And I would very much resonate with that. Before we get into the dosing, can you tell us about what was going on that led up to your holy shit moment in the forest with LSD? Yeah, there was uh, a lot as far as my mind was uh, perceiving at the time. Um, I had gone through a number of changes, I think, uh, fairly common, maybe in like a sort of uh, classic, um, I don't know, like finding thyself sort of story. Uh, but there's uh, there was a point, I was diagnosed at 23. Um, I received that diagnosis. I had a, a fairly in-depth understanding of what that diagnosis you know, sort of meant in an intellectual sense, I was still a bit burdened by the belief that I was, you know, you, you name it, whatever sort of negative connotative word that comes to mind, I was broken, I was crippled, I was, I couldn't be fixed, uh, I was cursed, uh, anything, I felt really burdened by not being able to know what everyone else seemed to know. And it's, uh, I likened it to being like a, a food critic that was asked to review food, but didn't have a tongue, there was a certain bitterness that I felt towards uh, just humans, as I so often referred to them in my younger years, because 
they seemed like a foreign species. Like if you had said like that I was like, uh, and a lot of autistics might echo the same, like, you know, that I was like, didn't even come from this planet or something. I would have been like, well, okay, maybe like there was a certain really, especially foreign feeling to being in my own body that was really uncomfortable. And um, just, again, I had friendships, I had relationships, I had people in my life, but my ability to connect with them was like I had to really just churn that mental math and it was exhausting and I hit a point where I just kind of got this sort of vertigo sort of sense of like everything seemed to be collapsing all at once I I left my uh, my job from an office job that I had a relationship of some time that came to an end as well and then my good friend he was uh, killed by a drunk driver and all of these events happened in like a series of a couple of like weeks. And I was just like, this is, this is hell essentially. That's how I saw it. Um, and I didn't want to be around any reminders of anything. I, I felt like everything I saw was like an echo of that trauma. Everything was like a reminder. And there's a certain unique feature of the autistic mind, something that I've sort of turned uh, what I believe to be into a positive tool in this, you know, sort of post psychedelic era of my life wherein I'm able to, you know, have that sort of laser focus on one topic or one interest or uh, go very deep on something and really hold it. Uh, there was also the same reality with this trauma. I just, everywhere I looked, every, I didn't want to like have my eyes open. I didn't want to be awake. I didn't want to be anywhere. And so I, I left, I sold all my stuff. I, I got on a train, I packed a sm pretty small backpack, I brought a bike and I, I left and that was when I had the opportunity to, to try LSD. And at the time I had no, I had no concept of any of these possible uh, effects being engendered by it. I went into it, I believe just approaching it as though it was like a general drug experience as though it was like alcohol or something. I went into it believing like, this will be a fun escape. Here I go. And it ended up being like the most engaging experience of my whole life. And yeah, I mean, I could talk about that forever, and I do. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Huxley said that you probably only need half a dozen good trips in your life, and you can mostly feed off of those. Yeah, there's so much. I'm still, I'm still unpacking it. I always will be unpacking it because it's, again, it's one point of awareness versus how I see it. You know, it's if you go to the mountaintop and you, you, return to the valley you can look back and see the mountaintop and vice versa and there's always there's always opportunities for reflection and, and nuance and it's just yeah but you know i went from that sort of hellacious place to uh something just that touched me in a way that i had no concept of uh prior and it wasn't even conceptual it was just like intuitive it was it was a felt awareness and I had some of the hallmarks of a conventionally described psychedelic experience as far as nature connection, a sort of blissful feeling, things that I've learned to be, you know, sort of like serotonin induced calm and all these other sort of normal facets of maybe a, you know, a more broad psychedelic experience. But when it really uh, turned the corner for me was I had encounters, um, with other individuals during that same day. And the very first person that I saw after I left my sort of isolated place in that, in the forest was, they just said, hi. And I was like, hi. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, how do I, how is this? Like, how is this? What? Like it, it, it like hit me like a, like a, anything like a, like standing in front of a speaker at a concert. It was their, their personhood, like striking me. And as they spoke positively about something, I was like, oh, man, I feel better because you're speaking really positively about this. And they're like, yeah, and, I, and they're like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I wasn't speaking that out loud, like literally, but they were like, the weather's nice. And I was like, yeah, the weather's great. And like, there was this whole other dimension that up till then, words were a, a way of sending like a sort of Morse code that was like secondary information. Like I say a word they say a word, I turn that word into a concept, I turn that concept into like, how do I, what do I do? Everything was like a means to an end. But in this moment, it was like, I understood that social exchange could be like singing to one another, like that we're singing to each other. And I had no previous awareness of that. And that's, <laughs> that's everything. I was like born in that moment. Wow. And 
that was a really interesting part of your book is describing how later you realize that all those amazing parts that are classic psychedelic trips were simply a regular part of it. Uh, I think what's really fascinating is that knowledge of emotionality, just like sometimes you see new colors or new ways of looking at things. Uh, and it's just, it's such an entrancing vision you paint. And I was wondering, you know, how did that play out over the next uh, hours and days as you kind of unlock this way of seeing the world, feeling the world? Yeah. Well, there's a few things to touch on, and I'm still exploring this. And I've tried to find also alternatives as far as like somatic body practices or meditation or yoga or things that sort of sustain that uh, mind body awareness. Um, because for a myriad reasons, um, you know, something like LSD, specifically in relation to tolerance profile, uh, you're not going to necessarily be able to sustain that depth of the drug effect. Um, and there's also still yet to be, you know, a fully understood uh, array of any long-term impacts of uh, routine LSD application. There's a lot of reasons um, why pursuing alternate alternatives and things like this, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. But at the time, um, you know, I liken it and I, I borrow a lot of metaphors because that's really the only way I can really send this sort of like ship that's in the bottle of my brain to your bottle of your brain so you can rebuild the ship in your brain kind of thing. And there's like a, there's this aspect of the psychedelic experience for myself. And this continues still now that during an exposure window, there is a heightened awareness there. I liken it to a contact lens, being able to uh, really see and perceive uh, not only visually, but as I mentioned, like kinesthetically, uh, auditorily, uh, and even down to, you know, in my youthful years, I was generally aloof to something as basic as like, what's the temperature of the room? Um, and so, you know, I, I, as far as I understand it, I'm not quite so aware of very many pharmaceuticals uh, or otherwise uh, that can el elucidate this sort of uh, awareness. I, and in these states, I was like, oh, my body's cold or like, oh, my body's warm or oh, I'm sad. Uh, outside of these states, I might not have had that same immediate intuitive access, but I had a memory, almost like a sense memory. And you can just imagine how, you know, in the initial phase, I was just like, uh, you know, I, I draw the analogy again of like those colorblind glasses um, that exist. I think they're called enchroma glasses and they, they, well, how those work. And I think this is another apt metaphor is they actually filter down like the frequencies of, uh, of the color spectrum you're receiving. So they're not adding color. They're actually filtering it out. So they're like, they're enabling you, uh, you know, in the way that the mind is sort of like a predicting machine in some capacity it's enabling this sort of like parsing of information to be more clear. It's sort of taking uh, the otherwise uh, overly simplified version and providing more nuance uh, in that same sense. Like those overlaps in, in perception become more clearly defined and, and more workable. And so in the state of, you know, in a psilocybin or LSD induced state, that clarity is able to return. Absent of that, I have tried to apply meditation and yoga as well and found successes in that. And I really try to, you know, so many people will come to me and say like, how do I do what you did? And my first sentiment is like, if it's within your capacity, please consider somatic practices as a means of exploring this very same phenomenon, um, hmm. both because of illegalities and also yet to be known factors. Um, but irregardless, I did go through a difficult time too, where I was attempting to stay in that like deeply felt place using just LSD. And that created some difficulties as well as sort of like, you know, I think uh, there's a natural wanting to remain in that place. And for me, yes, there were aspects of sort of transcendence and uh, sort of other, you know, sort of states, but I, I sort of fell into uh, taking like a sub transcendent dose, if, if one could say so, like a, a, a somewhere between like a, a definitely above a, a micro dose and uh, in the sort of like low to medium range. And the reason why was because it was enabling this sort of deeply felt 
uh, kinesthetic processing, intuition, um, but I wasn't going, uh, again, like so far out, quote unquote, or perhaps my default mode network wasn't down regulating so much that I was losing um, the sort of sense of self uh, or the sense of, us, you know, I, ego identification. And so I was working through a lot of issues related to myself, my relationship with others. And so you know, I'd sort of go up into this sort of LSD induced state, I would interface with other individuals, I would see those interactions in wholly new ways. And I'd also be able to look backwards, like at my whole life and be like, wow, I remember last time this came up that I didn't respond this way. I didn't respond at all. Like I must have just appeared to be cold, or I must have appeared to be just like uncaring, basically. And I began to see sort of like the origins of a lot of the crumblings of a lot of my relationships just by looking backwards through this new lens. It was like, again, that like colorblind glasses analogy. It was like, you know, you see those videos and they're just like, people are like, oh, look, flowers. Oh, look, anything. Like anything looks new through that new lens. And I felt much the same. Like I rewatch movies and I was like, did you guys know there's this much like information like here in this thing? Like that it's, it's just there. Like, again like 10 million metaphors but it's like it's like telling people did you know that like this magic eye puzzle has like an eagle in it and everyone's like yeah and like I'm like I didn't know that I didn't know that and then like once I saw the eagle and the magic eye I was like oh cool okay and it just became everything I became infatuated by being alive and that was on the heels of being suicidal so like I since then, I've just considered every single minute of my life to be an extra credit of sorts, a sort of, I wouldn't even have the time to tell you about any of this, if not for exactly this. And so it's like, I owe my life to this. It's my life's passion. Um, and I know I've gone in a million directions about this. I tend to, but I'll take pause here and, and open it up for, for any other question. Um, I can see why it's so engaging. Uh, it's engaging, it's really engaging to hear about. It's a hero's journey. Um, I mean, because the one quote from the book that really struck me, I watching movies getting better definitely was a striking part as well. Uh, but just the quote, uh, before L LSD, emotionality was an invisible phenomenon. And I just love that with, uh, that metaphor for what happened for you on top of all the other crazy things that happen on LSD that are so overwhelming. You had that one as well. Yeah. And, and again, it was as though uh, it was just an, another frequency that I hadn't yet attuned to. And again, going back to meditation or yoga, any number of things like this, those also seem to bring me back to that same point of awareness. I went to a, a 10 day Vipassana retreat and the first couple of days were challenging, like having to face myself, my, my thoughts, my patterns. But by about day seven or eight, I was like, this seems like I have just taken LSD. Like this seems very similar. Um, and in a way that was almost surprising. Uh, and uh, again, going over to research and you'll find, no, there's brain imaging studies supporting a lot of correlation between the neural activity uh, of something like LSD or psilocybin. And, and likewise, like the, the brain images you're seeing of like deep meditators as well. Um, and so it's it's turned me on to this whole thing. And as far as, you know, that, that emotionality aspect, I think that that's really close to me as someone who identifies within the autistic advocacy community. I think there's a gross misunderstanding that like we're incapable of uh, having uh, empathy or demonstrating empathy. I think there's a lot of nuance and I direct anyone listening to to the work of Katrin Preller. She's a, a Swiss neuroscientist researcher. Uh, she's worked a lot with hallucinogens, including LSD and psilocybin. And she's looked a lot into uh, the effects of something like psilocybin on uh, cognitive empathy versus emotional empathy. Uh, the difference being like, obviously, cognitive being something of like an intellectual effort, uh, processing it through different brain centers, um, and, co and emotional empathy being obviously this sort of felt empathy. Mm. Uh, and that's they've kind of done these studies through the lens of questionnaires or responses. And they're finding similarly that with psilocybin, that emotional empathy in a general, even in just a general healthy population is increasing. Um, so none of this is necessarily new about psilocybin or MDMA, um, but it was assuredly brand new to myself at that time. Um, and I, and more than, you know, 
offering this up as, you know, this is a, a means of getting there. It's also a means of deepening our understandings of the mechanistic behaviors of the autistic mind um, and, and, and bringing us to a better understanding um, because there's a lot, there's people are still uh, in the midst, scientists included, there's still, is no agreed upon like neural signature of an autistic brain. Um, and, and there's so many cultural reasons. There's a lot of complex reasons in terms of how do we measure um, and what measuring tools are we using and on and on and on. So, you know, in the grand scheme of everything, if anyone out there listening is an autistic, has an autistic that they care for, um, you know, the, the best approach to caretaking for yourself and others is, is to advocate for any autistic's ability uh, to allow uh, those persons to uh, voice their needs, to honor those needs, to accommodate those needs. Because uh, I think of so many situations that, you know, uh, even absent of that sort of certain emotional awareness, uh, there's just a different form of processing. You know, an autistic might, you know, demonstrate their love uh, through an act of service um, more so than uh, through, you know, this sort of, I don't know, this sort of like emotional wavelength sort of messaging. Um, but at its deepest place, it's bordering on like ESP nearly, it feels as far as like that intuitive awareness and like the immediacy of detecting vibrationality of other beings. It, it's, it's really uh, intense. And I think I wonder similarly in other people as well, uh, as far as autism goes, if it's a matter of, you know, an absence of uh, that sort of emotional uh, processing, or is it quite the opposite? And there's a very intensely felt empathetic state that requires a sort of uh, dampening of the signal over time in order to survive daily life. Um, so those are all potentially unanswerable questions, but it's, I try to speak to the complexity because really more than, you know, I never want to be the person that's like, this is what autism is because any statement that is as such is going to be met with an autistic person who's like, that's not my autism. And so the relativity of this is so important for me to reemphasize. It's a, just such a landscape. And at a certain point, we start talking about the complexity of any given individual, regardless of if they identify as neurodiverse or neurotypical or autistic, whatever it may be. Um, so that's that, those are all aspects of that sort of emotional awareness that are deeply important. I just, I think there's so many ways to misunderstand my work and I, I scramble from a place of love to uh, rush to uh, undo possible assumptions about the work <laughs> uh, in these ways. And it's good because it's very practical what you are advocating for. And you're also telling people to do their own homework, you know, that this is, you're not advocating for everybody, uh, which is a, seems like the most reasonable way to go about it. Yeah. What's amazing is how often I hear of people's lives being changed by taking five or 10 milligrams of CBD every day. That's such a small amount. And yet for so many, that's their sweet spot. Five milligrams in the morning, five milligrams in the evening. So while our first advice on CBD is always start low, go slow. For some people, they soon realize that 20 or 30 milligrams of CBD a day isn't getting them the health outcomes they're looking for. We know that you can benefit from higher levels of CBD. So it makes sense to have a supplement where you can take one capsule with 50 milligrams. That's why we created our Maximum Strength Soft Gels. Each one contains 50 milligrams of CBD, plus everything else that you love from a full spectrum hemp extract. The other cannabinoids, the terpenes that enhance the entourage effect, and the rich fatty acids that are used by the plant to make its cannabinoids and used by our brains and bodies to make our own endocannabinoids. That's all the pieces of the plant working together for good, helping to enhance the effects of that 50 milligrams of CBD. We created it because people needed it. So always start low and go slow, but don't be afraid to go high and fly. Use a coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbdoil.com for 25% off our maximum strength CBD soft gels. But you did come up with your own idea 
uh, with your own method, methodology. And so can you tell me about how you came to the idea of LSD immersion therapy and what that means? Yeah, I mean, I, I as I mentioned earlier, in the initial phase, I didn't read like a single thing on the internet before I tried LSD the first time, which is not advisable um, <laughs> at all. Um, and so after that, there was two things that happened. One, I was like, this must be what LSD is like for everyone, which parts of it, sure. But these other very particular changes are seen to be more specific to this sort of autistic uh, processing. And so, you know, I started to read more and more. And, you know, as far as, you know, finding that sort of dose range that I mentioned with the immersion therapy days, it was an initial effort to remain in that state, followed by a sort of awareness of like, oh, I can't remain that way, not only because of the sheer nature of the substance uh, and the tolerance, but also there's like an impracticality of like, if you're, if you're just, if you're just like a walking ball of love, it becomes impractical uh, to agree to most of the games of what's happening uh, around you. Most of the time, you're just kind of like, do we, is this, does this other thing seem that important in comparison to just sitting here and being in love with being alive and being with these people? Like, do we, are we really in that much of a hurry, everybody? Like there was a certain, that ostracized me a bit in a, in an unexpected way. Um, and so for better or for worse, I found myself gravitating towards doses that were, again, I was working with like blotter and I, I, I used like testing kits, which uh, are very easy to uh, find as far as the testing kits are concerned, uh, just to ensure my safety and and working with like volumetric dosing in order to ensure uh, repeated uh, like regularity and understanding. And I, and I found that a dose range of between like 20 and 50 micrograms was the ideal range. And even for that dose range, that's fairly uh, broad in terms of effect. Um, and so I would sort of walk it through from, you know, the zero to 15 micrograms being what's potentially considered a microdose or a subperceptive dose, at least as far as anecdotal reports are concerned, emerging uh, research is supporting somewhat. And again, those are generally with just broad, healthy, normal populations uh, being exposed in that regard. Um, but I was experimenting uh, more in the 20 to 50 range because I found that at 20 uh, micrograms, which is some refer to it as a threshold dose, that I was beginning to notice the effect. If a, if a microdose is a subperceptive dose, then I was taking a, a, a perceptive dose, a super perceptive uh, threshold dose, however it may be. Um, but at that lower range, I found that I was able to access that sort of kinesthetic awareness, that intuitive awareness. Um, but I also felt that I was able to be fairly organized and disciplined in adhering to the rules or what's known as like priors in terms of like prior conditioning uh, maps and patterns. Um, so in that sense, that was useful for like remaining on task while also being social. At the closer to 50 microgram range, I found that I could go much deeper into the energetic fields of other beings. I could feel their presence more strongly. I could work through issues of my own heart more readily. But I also found myself less inclined to take the games of civilized life very seriously at those ranges. And so that wasn't very practical if I was trying to get uh, a work of some sort done of a very particular nature um, or, you know, certain things. And so in that sense, uh, that immersive uh, immersion therapy approach that I mentioned it was just as much uh, a place of intuition. I think, you know, Fadiman has his dosing regimen of uh, essentially like every 72 hours have being a sufficient washout period, um, which is fairly supported by uh, some of the uh, growing actual like genuine bona fide research that's now out there that is supported that uh, I think I saw a study the other day mentioning that uh, that three day period was sufficient uh, to yield a similar subjective effect. Uh, I think they were dosing more in like the 75 microgram range, but it was essentially deduced that, I mean, and these, you can look up, you can look up the safety profile of LSD, you can look up, all these things have been understood for very much a long time, like the work of Torsten Passi, other, uh, other researchers, most especially those in Europe who've had a little bit more friendlier access to it by virtue of it being the origin of the drug. Um, 
but I, that, again, that 20 to 50 microgram range, I was acting from a place of intuition of being like, what is my intention for this day? Where will I be? Who will I be surrounded with? What am I, what is my goal with this experience? Is it to connect? Is it to uh, achieve a task uh, by on and on? And so, you know, in that much that same way, it wasn't so much like, oh, it's been 72 hours. I need to take another dose. There were plenty of times where I was like, I, everything seems just fine. Um, and so I, I, I came to see it almost, you know, initially it was something that was an educational tool. It was a teacher. It showed me what I could not see. Um, but in time, it became more of like an intervention tool. I'd be like, I noticed that I'm getting a bit more rigid about this idea, or I've noticed this sort of recent trauma is really bouncing around in my head. I'd like to work with that. I'd like to explore that. Um, and so maybe in the way that one might become especially privy to when they need, a, you know, like to take a Pepto-Bismol or something when they have like a stomach ache, I think I sort of became more in tune with, hmm, I have like a, I have a need for a mental hygiene uh, at this time. I have a need for a sort of a, a cleansing of the mind, a resetting, uh, an exploration. And again, that's obtainable through somatic practice, meditation, and yoga. But I, I, in that early phase, I really found that um, before I was really uh, experienced uh, with meditation, it was just such a gravitational pull into the very sort of exact mental space that I needed to occupy to work through a lot of my uh, traumas of my earlier years, not only the most recent years, but all through life. I think if you talk to autistics, you'll find they're all uh, predisposed somewhat um, to traumatic experiences for a lot of the reasons I mentioned. Like if you don't know exactly what's going on, anything seems like a threat and if you're like living in fight or flight like how are you going to enter that sort of parasympathetic state and you know a lot of that's been understood over time too through a lot of my experiences so it's i've walked around my mind uh so much and yeah so i'm just an open book i try to be and that's where we have the sunday groups too for our integration and and other other autistics who are either trying to learn more about psychedelics or make sense of psychedelic experiences or who just are seeking other neurodiverse persons to interact with i think that's any of those things uh, have helped me and i think a lot of people within our, our autistic psychedelic community would, would voice the same and can you share a little bit more about the community and what uh the meetups do for uh the autistic psychedelic community yeah, so we founded that in uh, April of this year, um, and it really just came about by, you know, we were in the quarantine, the lockdown, and I had a, a need to go somewhere. I feel like I had hit a wall with, I'd grown tired of talking about my own story, essentially, um, and I needed the input of others. I needed to learn more about myself through the interaction with others, and I wanted to make that same safe, safe space. Because in my, you know, I'm 33 now, these experiences that I had were some six years ago. And initially, I just had nowhere to go with it. I think I went to like Eastern philosophy books to try to make sense of some of it. I went to, you know, what literature there was. I don't think I was that privy to how much research I could discover just yet. So it was a very lonely experience. And I, I don't want anyone to ever have to go through uh, something, especially the contrast of that was... <laughs> This is the most beautiful and amazing and impactful experience of my life. I can't tell anyone about this um, because it's illegal, because it's taboo, because they don't understand if they haven't gone through it. Um, and I wanted to create a space for people who needed exactly that. And there's days that I need that. And so like I'm here for those people. I've also worked um, with a, a neurobiology grad student, Justine Lee. She's been my partner with this and she's working on drumming up like a dissertation that zeroes in on a lot of these sort of serotonergic properties uh, of autism. And, and we're trying to really come at this from, you know, we're collaborating on uplifting one another in just a general peer support sense. We're trying to help each other with integration as far as you know, sometimes when you're like, you just need someone to be like, you know, you walk into that kind of integration group and you're like, does anyone, has anyone ever had like a bad experience? And just to have someone be like, yeah, that happens too. Let's talk about it. Like, 
And that's so essential. And so we've tried to first and foremost, create a safe space. And secondarily, we have kind of put our heads together on how can we, you know, turn this into, you know, because it began as it never was my story. I was one of the first few to maybe publish about it or put my full name behind it. But as I've come to find, and I have a long list of quotes that I've now received through the surveys we put up on our site, I have people who are 70 years old that are saying, oh, yeah, back in like 1977, I was using psychedelics to treat what I didn't even realize was autism until I was diagnosed in like 2005. Like there's like this, none of this is new. It's just newly talked about. And so I'm here for all those people. And those people are here for me and they've lifted me up they've helped me understand and so right now my next initiative and our collective initiative is is to bundle those stories to help inform future research and also to self-advocate because again we're not curing our autism we're also simultaneously like (laughs) we're not broken like that's a that's a constant that's a constant echo in the group. It's it's that embracement of, of the inherent intelligences. I meet so many people that are bordering on genius in that room because they have been focused on something for who knows how many years. And they are just profound in the way that they can present those, whatever it may be. And, you know, there's there's a layer of this group too where we're simply letting it be known that autistics have cognitive liberty. Like they have an ability to explore their own consciousness just as any person might. Uh, But similarly, this idea of like an autistic person being exclusively a frail or fully uh, disoriented person isn't the full picture. There are certainly autistics who struggle a great deal with some of those stereopic behaviors there are many autistics with engaging in self injurious behaviors there's many autistics who seem to be aloof in certain ways i'm not trying to generalize in any capacity but an autistic person ought not be discluded um, on the grounds purely of that uh, diagnosis not not only because of some of these um, subjective reports we're receiving but again from a more like caring place uh, just just that self-advocacy aspect most everything that i've seen as far as autism advocacy is generally oriented towards the parents who might be like paying for services for youths but it's estimated that anywhere from like 140 to 1 and 150 on the very loose side of the estimation uh is autistic or on the spectrum so if we're taking those numbers, we're talking about like hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and those individuals all are among us and some are diagnosed, some can't afford a diagnosis, some live in a culture in which diagnosis doesn't come about. There's just so many complex layers. And so if not for this group that I've surrounded myself with, I would have never come into an awareness of, of how varied that is. And I think Zoom is a unique opportunity because we're able to cross those cultural lines, have people we meet like on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And so we have people um, throughout Europe that come and attend South America, Central America, North America. Um, even some Australians will pop in when they're able to make the clock work. And there's just this sense that, you know, it's a, it's a genuine community. And I'm intrigued by this idea of what happens when neurodiverse people occupy the same space because most of us have that generalized experience of being the one odd person in the room and when we're all odd it's like i'm very much obsessed with this idea of like sort of like normalizing abnormalcy uh that's like sort of like a a way that i put it very often uh i love that uh that could be a bumper sticker and a tattoo it's (laughs) Um, and, and I really enjoy what you're saying about the, the power of the community coming together like that and the wisdom of communities in sharing their stories. Because in things so complex, you know, clinical studies often, you know, are never going to quite solve it. Stories really capture the complexity of, of humans. Yeah. One thing I was wondering is 
from your community if you've heard pros and cons about the various psychedelic materials out there um, for helping people, if some seem to have more uh, warnings of risk, or if it's just you've seen trends from all the different stories that you've heard. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think uh, rather like I'll get I think I'll get to a summary of your question in, in a moment. If it's OK, I'd like to read maybe like three or four choice quotes from some of the surveys we've gotten. That'd be great. OK, um, so again, we put a survey. It's still on the autistic psychedelic site. So autistic psychedelic dot com. That survey is just out there. If any autistics out there would like to participate, go for it. It's anonymous. We are utilizing the information for a lot of the exactly this purpose to understand and also to kind of broadcast and amplify the voices of those who, you know, a lot of people have the experience. They feel it's just as important as I felt it is, and they'd like to help others in the same way. So uh, some quotes that came in through uh, a recent survey were uh, June, who was age 26, autistic and ADHD, said, on psychedelics, I had a first time experience of being calm, safe and certain in my mind. I learned that I don't need to control my sensory experience in order to stay sane. Actually, I learned quite the opposite. Um, and uh, I'll go through two other quick quotes and just kind of double back on these two. Um, another individual, um, Emily, age 20, with Asperger's syndrome said, LSD caused me to react to this incredible amount of happiness, which I usually have trouble expressing by sobbing from that happiness for the very first time in my life. Um, Another individual, uh, Thomas, age 30, autistic and ADHD, said before psychedelics, when I heard a dog barking outside or a loud car or a door slammed or someone dropping a plate, I was getting very angry, almost raging, especially if I tried to concentrate. This is 100% gone. Today, when there's a loud noise anywhere, it doesn't hurt anymore. I'm totally calm. So I think there's a lot of variations in our experiences. Uh, for example, that last one mentioned, Thomas uh, uh, struggled with something else uh, that's still being explored as far as how do uh, the sensory experience of, you know, a sound uh, engender a, a painful uh, sort of synesthetic almost effect. And what's interesting is that, you know, some people relate psychedelics to inducing synesthesia, but I've heard from other autistics who say that it's alleviated or balanced out some of like the, the sort of visceral nature of that synesthesia. And that's where we're starting to think that that serotonin modulation is probably influential, but I'm not going to get into the neuroscience side of it. But as far as the trends we're seeing, I think that there's an, a universal benefit to individuals just reporting that they could experience a different state when they change from their normal state of awareness to another, whether that state that they changed to was pleasant or unpleasant, however it was, they could understand their normal state. And a metaphor I draw often is going from uh, the swimming pool to the hot tub and realizing that the swimming pool is cold or that, that it even has temperature at all. And like, until you were to change that, you're so acclimated. You're so acclimated to being in this immediate experience through the conditioned responses that you're so conditioned to having. And as soon as you separate out from that, you're able to be like, oh, I have conditioned response. Like <laughs> that is so empowering in its own right. And, and for autistics, especially, uh, I think it, it's really a, a strong point. But some of those other market changes, I have no immediate explanation for. And that's why we have the survey as far as someone, uh, you know, and I, uh, in, in speaking with uh, that individual a bit more, it seemed to be that same trend of there's an awareness that we have a choice of how we react to our reactions. And as soon as we become aware of that, we can be, we can become like the interventionist upon our own conscious experience. We don't have to be attacked by what's unfolding. We can observe it. The, a, a metaphor I also draw often is like I went from a sort of fire hose of information being blasted at me to sort of being able to look out at like an ocean of information. And I think that that same general experience is, is echoed in a lot of individuals. Um, again, and hearing from people as old as 70 years old and beyond who are still benefiting from psychedelics. Um, and so those are obviously like the, the positive aspects. There are for sure risks involved. Um, 
not only, you know, the physiological risks um, in terms of, you know, uh, anything that has to do with potential with LSD specifically, at least there's some suspicions of like 5-HT2B or sort of like endangerments to the heart or vasoconstriction for like re repeated usage or usage over time. Relative safety panels are showing degrees of safety with psilocybin and, and LSD as well that are very promising. Um, I don't want to go too deep and I also want to kind of stay in my lane, but uh, as far as the, the real risks, I think, are going through these experiences unguided or alone, not knowing what to do with any of these insights are going to, it's just going to maybe exaggerate an already sort of isolated state. Um, if I'm speaking maybe more specifically to higher dose experiences, in speaking in relation to like low to medium dose, I think uh, another part of why I presented that and also why I fell into that was it seemed to mitigate a lot of the other peripheral risks, like the odds of uh, sort of being like fully uh, in a difficult or fully challenging experience were seemed to be decreased when I was taking a low to moderate dose. Um, and some would say like from a psychoanalytic background that higher doses are perfect because they induce these challenges because they make us face these challenges. Um, but again, those are psychoanalytic approaches that often involve direct guidance, psychotherapy support. Um, so, you know, like anything, the challenges of these medicines aren't the medicines themselves. They're the place in which they're being taken, the intention in which they're being taken, the support, the associated diet. I mean, the most immediate and obvious dangers are any sort of uh, family histories of uh, any sort of psychosis or schizophrenia uh, and like any sort of blood lineages and as well uh, any sort of predisposition um, uh, or rather excuse me uh, more so any potential interaction between any other pharmaceuticals uh, those are the most obvious uh, concerns um, to point out and that's where medical screeners and access within legal markets, which again, you, any human on earth that can go through a medical screener and make their way to the Netherlands or Jamaica at this point in time in history can legally obtain psilocybin assisted services. So like it's, this isn't like a matter of like needing to shift policy, it's available. And I hear from people that go to those markets and have positive experiences too. Um, and it's all about, again, harm reduction, harm reduction, harm reduction. So yeah, there's no shortage of literature on that. Great. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, from your experience. I was wondering if you wanted to uh, close by uh, just offering any last advice or someone who got really intrigued by what you're saying, um, what, you would, what you would say to them, both in the, the good and the bad. Yeah, I would say, you know, again, Irregardless of uh, if the person who's intrigued is, uh, well, I guess maybe I would like to speak to maybe specific subcategories of, of persons in specific. If, if there's anyone in the research domains, uh, anyone in the medical sciences that wants to discuss this, collaborate, uh, reach out to me. I'm an open book. I try to really make this sort of an open science initiative. Um, and if there's any individuals who are autistics or caretakers of autistics, again, I go back to the safest thing I can always say is to do your research because I'm in no position to make any direct recommendation. Um, by necessity and by the virtue of the absence of uh, having anything other than the internet to rely upon, I always, always, always encourage people to dive into the research of somatic body practices, first and foremost, of non-drug interventions. Um, because again, we're seeing a fairly decent overlap between the drug effects and the effects of meditation and yoga. And for some, those practices are a little bit more difficult to engage in. Some autistics have issues with body movement or other, other sort of things. But I, again, harm reduction and researching and learning about harm reduction and if you're someone who's gone through a psychedelic experience and you need support, we have the Sunday group. You can find us. You can also look up on a site like meetup.com and find a local psychedelic community. There's just no shortage of resources. Um, just know that whatever you're going through, like you're not going through it alone. And that if, you know, no one in your immediate physical environment uh, 
is there to really fully understand that uh, there's there's a whole wide, world, big wide internet of of persons offering support and information and and everyone just please be safe and in, in everything that ever anyone is uh you know, exploring. But again, I, I can't make any direct endorsement. I say it so many times in my book, like, please do not try this at home, potentially try this under the guidance of a professional in the future, or find a legal as in L E G A L market and go on an exploration. If you meet the criteria for a medical screener, uh, pass. So that's a uh, very specific information, but it's, I, I didn't have that sort of insight some years ago. So I, I try to do my best while being respectful uh, of the risks and being humbled by uh, all of the, the, you know, the potentials for uh, negative outcomes, just as much as positives. Um, so uh, from a place of love, I just I encourage everyone to be safe and, and to, to learn as much uh, about them themselves, other autistics first and foremost, and to really question, um, before they want to seek a change, uh, try to understand why it is that they haven't sought acceptance before uh, the the seeking of a change. Um, because for me, again, going back to the book, alter and appreciate are both in the title because I could change my perceptions, but I could also return and I could feel at home and feel appreciative of uh, what I feel is a, a genuine gift in, in my neurological predisposition. So yeah. And beyond that, the last thing I'll say is if anyone wants to, uh, read my work, you can go to autism on acid.com, download the audio book or the digital book or anything like this. There's also journey music that I made in psychedelic states that is intended to support psychedelic states. And there's also autisticpsychedelic.com that I mentioned. That's for support and surveying. And last but not least, if anyone out there has any issues with costs related to accessing any of this information or these downloadable elements or anything at all, just send me a message. I'd be more than happy to accommodate and to help uh, deepen understandings, especially during a, a time of uh, kind of worldwide crisis such as now. Uh, happy to happy to. Uh, send along any content if, if people have the need uh, in that regard. So I'll take pause there. As you can tell, I could talk at Infidium about this, but I'll take pause. <laughs> well, great. Thank you for that and for that offer. Uh, it's really an amazing array of resources that you put together. And so I'd encourage anyone to check it out. We'll have all of the links uh, to Aaron's work in the episode notes. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time to talk to us today, as well as for all the research that you've pulled together. It's really uh, been amazing for me to learn from you. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you also for providing this platform and, you know, for, for amplifying the voices of others who, who also have like a message of care uh, in the same regard. So I thank you so much, Lex. Until next time. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, find us at pluscbdoil.com or on YouTube or on all the podcast platforms. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com or follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex Files Show. If you enjoyed this program, please rate us on iTunes or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. Our chief advisor is Amabel De La Cruz. The music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. And our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. Remember the coupon code, Lex Files. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.